Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, welcome wherever you are. Welcome back to what is the last in Sib Joe's Jewellery Industry Voices seminar here at Vicenza Oro. Thank you all of those joining live in the room, but especially thank you very much joining online. I hear there's a very good audience joining via the live stream, especially on YouTube, and thank you so much for joining us on a Sunday morning. Thank you for your time. My name is Edward Johnson. I'm the Corporate Responsibility Director for Gem Fields. I'm here simply to introduce the next speaker, the last in the seven events that Sibjo has put on over this weekend as part of the Jewelry Industry Voices seminar series. And I just wanted to remind everybody, if you weren't aware, about the genesis, the start of this series that we've been conducting here at Vicenza Oro. March 2020, can we remember it? When we suddenly were forced into a different way of life around the world and our community of people, industry members who traveled from place to place and sold and bought and discussed issues that affected them were suddenly put on hold. We weren't able to travel. It was at that time that Sibjo stepped into the void and started what became an extremely popular way of communicating and bringing us together as a community. That was the webinar series that was requested by Gaetano and that was delivered by Steve Benson. And I had the privilege of being the moderator for that series. And it was an ins inspirational time of everybody's life, one that we never want to have to go back to, obviously, but one where we all learnt grew and developed. It's all behind us now, but that ability to communicate and that ability to come together and discuss issues that are affecting us, of course, is still with us. Thank goodness we can do it live now and hybrid with everybody online. So I just wanted to reference the importance of communication, the importance of getting together and sharing information to tackle and solve problems. What are some of the issues in our industry? For me, when we did that series, we identified two clear challenges. One was sustainability and responsibility, and we've discussed those over the weekend. The other was technology. How does the trade embrace this new wave of technological solutions to the earth and businesses' challenges? How do we use data to drive business decisions? And we were joined in that series by a number of companies that sponsored us, allowed us to give them the space to have these conversations. And one was Uni Diamonds. So I'm really, really thrilled to be able to present today for our last in the series, Mahia Bohanju, who is the president of Uni Diamonds, to address some of these issues around big data in the diamond business. Mahia, thank you so much for joining with, and joining with us today. And the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Hello to the digital world, um, not just the physical people sitting here, but also those who are joining us digitally. Uh, a special thank you to the Italian Exhibition Group, Vicenza Oro, congratulations for 70 years of wonderful, wonderful um, uh, collaborations with uh, the, not just the Italian, but European and also global industry. Uh, and a very special thank you to Sibjo and Dr. Cavalieri for um, bringing us all together, allowing us to have this time to talk about various different important issues and challenges within the industry, and also to talk about um, a, a bit about what data transformation and information can actually do for an industry that is more than 120, more than 130 years old in the, in the making. As it was said, my name is Mahia Barhanju. I'm the president of Uni. Um, before starting, I thought we should just use some simple data to talk about mining in general. We heard a lot about mining and, and the impacts of mining and sustainability and everything else. I just thought I should put on paper at least what we know of how much mining actually impacts the entire world. So if you take all of the mines for everything that we mine in the world, 
and you actually put them all together and bunch them together into one place, and you calculate the square meters or square miles that all of the global mining in the entire world takes, it's about 38,600 square miles, roughly about the size of half of Italy, right? Take the top part of the boot, split it in half, that's how much the entire world's mining for copper, for platinum, for gold, for silver, for coal, for everything. That's how much land is required if you compare it to the rest of the land that there is in the world. Now, if you take that and then say, all right, all those natural resources and nature, how much of the world's GDP is actually coming from this 100,000 square kilometers of land. Almost half of the world's GDP, $44 trillion, right? So when we're talking about mining and, and the impacts of mining and, and what the mining companies are doing to become uh, carbon neutral and ethical and this and that, Really, you're talking about such a small amount of the world's land that is feeding and providing for such a huge amount of the world's GDP. So I thought that those are some interesting numbers to start out with. And then after that, I was going to throw myself into uh, uh, about less than 60 seconds of what uni is and what uni does. So uh, uni diamonds started out about five years ago. Uh, we're a data collector of the diamond industry. We went to all the manufacturers, all the wholesalers, um, and, and uh, quite a few of the retailers and said, share your data with us. And in return, we're going to aggregate it, sum it up, and provide you with data about the market and how the diamond industry is performing and what's happening and what's the supply and what's the demand and how things are going. Today, we're analyzing somewhere around 1.3, 1.4 billion dollars on a, uh, a billion stones, which is about three and a half billion dollars of daily inventory. Now, that's live, and that's what makes us very unique. Um, we look at data that, not, that hasn't just been sitting there and hasn't been actually used or, or information that sits there and is updated on a weekly basis. The only people that are allowed to put goods onto our data product and platform are people who actually have live data and live information. That's very critical to us because when we're analyzing somewhere around half a billion lines of, of code on a daily basis, we want to make sure that we're using the most updated information as possible to be able to provide our customers, the industry, with the most correct information that, that's available. So we took that data and we said, all right, we can now analyze it and provide market data, price, supply, demand, etc. We can take that data, put it on a platform, help actually sell those um, uh, diamonds to retailers and wholesalers and, and manufacturers. And we can create nice technology around it, wrap it all around with our uh, shareholder, um, who's also uh, our partner in this, Malka Amit, to be able to provide an end-to-end -end solution for our customers. So when you play, imagine Muni being the, the Amazon of the diamond industry. When you place an order, it goes into our system. We take care of all logistics, imports, exports, everything else, and get it to you at your door without any headaches, without any issues, without any problems. So that's all I'm going to say about Uni. Okay. Now, the idea behind Uni Diamonds and, and, and why we developed what we developed was really to simplify something that is somewhat complex. When a, a, a diamond professional graduates from a, um, GIA or any of the schools that are out there, they come into the industry really excited. They don't know what the market prices are. They don't know how to get the market prices. They don't understand the discount terminology that's used. They have a lot of confusion around, well, if I want to buy these diamonds, how much is it going to cost? Especially if you're like an independent um, 
uh, a person who's who's designing your own jewelry and and trying to get into this market. So what we wanted to do was create something that really demystifies our industry and simplifies it and provides transparency and information. And that's the whole idea of, of where uh, Uni Diamonds was created. This is not ours, it's from Bain. And the reason why I put it up is, is so that people can appreciate that the diamond industry is a cyclic industry, right? There are cycles within our industry. Sometimes it's dependent on what happens around the world. Sometimes it's purely dependent on what happens within the diamond industry. And what happens is, as any industry where there's supply and there's demand, well, if there's oversupply and less demand, prices come down. If there is less availability and more demand, prices go up. It shouldn't be any surprise. This is how most industries are, are, are run. And it's no different in, a, in the diamond industry. So as long as we've been keeping data in this industry, we've seen cycles of prices coming up and going down and coming up and going down. The last time I had the privilege of doing this presentation, I remember I actually um, said to uh, the people in the audience, this is the perfect time to buy diamonds because it will go up. Prices will move up. So buy it today. And I will say that today as well because we have seen the bottom of prices in diamonds and we are starting to see prices moving up. And not only I say that, but I will show it to you today so you can see how prices have been moving. If you look at the polish prices and what's happened within polish prices, well, we saw polish prices go up um, around March 2022 as demand started dropping, polish prices started coming down. There was a very long duration of, of drop in polish prices and that's perhaps what was so different this time around that it took so long for the floor to be set or the floor to be met. And we've met that. And we met it, interestingly enough, around uh, November of last year. End of October, beginning of November. So next time I say buy diamonds, please listen to me, okay? Um, because now prices are starting to go up and you've lost a few percentage points. That's all I'm going to say. But that, that's, that's the cycle that we've been in. And I'll explain why this cycle came about. But before doing that, I wanted to show where basically overall stock and inventory within the industry was. And as you can see, the stock and inventory in our industry started coming up higher and higher. So as prices started going down, inventory was being built up. And inventory has started to go down and prices are starting to stabilize, which should not be a surprise to anyone. But one unique difference this time around was that there was a category of goods that were kind of a competition to natural diamonds. And that category of goods was lab grown, especially in North America and perhaps parts of Europe. But a lot of Europe moved into colored stones and, and uh, other gems versus moving into lab grown, though some parts of Europe uh, and Great Britain um, actually moved into uh, uh, also transitioning to lab grown diamonds. Now, Lab-grown prices have dropped. Now, but lab-grown prices didn't drop because natural diamond prices moved in any way, shape, or form. They have completely different reasons for why the prices changed the way that they did. In fact, if I were to put the two graphs onto the same chart and show you what happened, what happened was in 2020 and 2021, there was a huge demand for natural diamonds. Why? Because in 2019 and 2020, we got into a very difficult time in the world. COVID hit, everyone got locked up in their houses, no one could go out, you know, a boyfriend couldn't see their girlfriend, uh, loved ones were separated from each other. So there was this pent up demand, this desire to actually want to show the person that you love them that you care about them. And that emotional statement is usually converted by buying a jewelry piece. And that jewelry piece usually has something to do with a natural diamond. 
right? Because what's better to give to someone to show that ultimate sign or symbol of love and everlasting relationships and appreciation of the other person than a diamond? So with this pepped up demand, what happened was when the world somewhat opened up, people started buying and they bought and they couldn't go on vacations and they couldn't travel. So what did they do? What they did was actually go and buy a jewelry piece, give it to their loved ones, which created this incredible aura for a year and a half of jewelry sales. The United States sold $60 billion of jewelry at a time when the highest amount that they had sold before, I think, was somewhere around $40 billion. So everyone was just so ecstatic and excited about how the industry's come back and how the world is, is in such a great place. Two years of this, and we started drinking our own Kool-Aid, as they say in the United States. We started believing that there's nowhere to, other than up for this industry. The only place that we're going to go is continuous movement. Prices are going to get stronger. Demand is going to get stronger. We don't have availability. We're trying to find rough to polish and, and make more and more diamonds for our customers. And then suddenly the world opened up. Travel began. Competition around technology began. Other doors opened up, and that led to a lesser demand for natural diamonds. And that's when you started seeing kind of a, a decrease in prices of diamonds. Prices of natural diamonds went up 43%, right? And then they dropped. Today, they're at 87%. If you take the halo aspect of our industry, those year and a half, two years that, um, that demand uh, from Northern America and other parts of the world came in, and you actually normalize the lines, you'll see that the change in prices wasn't that drastic. We just got used to such great numbers, such great feelings in our industry that we thought it's going to continue and it's going to continue. And then we realized, oh, wait, no, we have competition. We, we have to be smarter and we have to do more in order to be able to get there. Now, if you look at the graph of lab-grown diamonds, you'll see that the prices of lab-grown diamonds actually never really increased. They just kept dropping and kept dropping and they'll continue dropping. It's not going to stop. But why is that? I'll answer that question by asking a question. How many of you guys have an OLED TV or anything newer in the technology? Big screen, 65 inch, etc. Okay. If you were to look at OLED TVs when they first came out, a 65 inch OLED TV was $10,999. $10,000. Today, you can buy a Samsung OLED. 65 inch for $799. Okay? As technology improves and as there's efficiencies built in the system, it allows for manufacturers who are manufacturing products to be able to sell it cheaper. And that's exactly what's happened in lab grown. Lab grown diamonds are nothing but a technological capability that has been brought in to our industry. It's a competition to natural, but is it really? For now, yes. In the future, only time will tell. And that's one of the key messages and key takeaways of this presentation that I hope um, you all take home. As I continue to present about the data and the information, What's really important is taking this data, understanding it, but also using it in a way that will allow you to know what is the future that's about to come. And to be able to ensure that you put your industry, your business, and your organization into a successful place. That is why it's so important to look at data and understand it. 
Because if I was a lab-grown diamond manufacturer, I would know that on the wholesale side, the prices of lab-grown diamonds will probably go below 100 sometime this year per carat. And if I was a natural diamond uh, manufacturer or mining company, I would recognize that there is a ground that's been built and that built has been because there's supply and demand fundamentals are coming together and there are places where polish prices are now increasing because the demand is outweighing the supply and availability of the goods. Now, to present that and to show it factually, I thought it would be good to actually go onto our platform and look at it live because there's nothing better than to make me uh, think of something and, and actually be able to show it to you of what it means. So this is a uni platform. It's available for those who actually join uni and, and, and look at information and data. This is a diamond index that I had shown you. And if you look at it uh, from the beginning of time, you can see that the prices went up and now the prices in the past 30 days are not just stabilizing, but they're starting to go up, guys. So natural diamond, buy the goods. I'm telling you, buy. Okay. And then if you, if you take this and, and go into um, specific items and look at how items are doing in general, let's pick, um, let's pick one of my favorite categories, which is kind of a neutral category, because in this category, the luxury brands use it. In this category, um, retailers like Costco use it. And in this category, independent retailers around the world also use it. An HVS1 one carat diamond. Now, if you look at an HVS11 carat diamond, uh, in the past 365 days, the prices have gone down by about 26%. But if you look at it in the past 30 days, the prices are starting to climb back up again. Now, if we look at that same HVS1 and look at it more in depth than in detail, what you'll be able to see is how the prices have been doing uh, let's say, let's look at it in the past 365 days as we had shown. But in the past 30 days, you can see that the prices are starting to change. And the better quality HVS1 prices are actually starting to increase. The average prices for, for HVS1 goods are starting to increase. But why is that? Because as you look at the supply and demand graph for these goods, more people are wanting the goods, less of these goods are available, and hence an increase in the price, right? So that's the, the uniqueness of, of, of the data that we can provide. We're looking at close to a half a billion data points on a daily basis and analyzing all this information to try and, and, and make sense of it and give you some data and information that would be um, advantageous to you and your businesses. Now, if we look at how uh, that is impacted by supply change, supply change meaning availability of supply and, and, and what uh, the demand for those goods are. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of red here. If we were to have looked at this earlier, there would be a whole bunch of greens here because there were more supply and less availability. Now there's less supply and more demand uh, for the goods. In fact, if you look at that same category of goods of one carat uh, HVS1, what you're gonna be able to see is that about on a daily basis, 20% on, uh, 20 of the goods are being actually purchased of what's available. So whatever that comes in and whatever that goes out, you're getting a lot of the goods that are continuously moving which is good news for our industry. And it makes us actually feel like things are coming back. The industry, the diamond industry, the natural diamond industry is getting back to a, a good place. And there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is because retailers are realizing that with lab-grown prices continuously going down, they're not gonna be able to continue to make the profit margins that they were before, right? Imagine you buy a product for $1,000, you sell it for $3,000, you make a $2,000 margin, okay? Now, imagine that product now becomes $100, and now you're selling it for $2,000.
or $1,100 or $1,200. You're making less margins in general, right? So if I were to look at a natural diamond, one carat, which is being sold in, in, into um, retailers in the United States, probably at about $6,000, the margins that they make on that may not as a percentage be high, but at value it's high, right? And that allows them to be able to market and advertise. That allows them to be able to pay their employees, to pay their bills. But with lab grown, they're gonna have to sell five to 10 times more of those goods to be able to make the same margins as they would in value with natural diamonds. So as retailers are starting to realize this, and they saw their holiday season sales this year, and they know that next year, the value of, of lab grown is gonna go down even more. They're not gonna be able to make as much margins. Heck, there's only so many consumers that are gonna to wanna to get married, so they're not gonna be able to increase the number of consumers that are coming into their doors. They have two choices. One choice is to continue to sell lab grown, see lower overall value that they are getting in, or two is to transition back to natural diamonds and sell that to be able to continue to have the benefits that they did. And in fact, we saw some of that this year. You know, if, if you look at uh, uh, Tenoris BI, uh, which is a company that also uh, analyzes data in our industry, they saw that lab-grown diamonds was about 47% of sales during the holiday season this year. And what they saw, which I thought was very, very fascinating, is the retailers that they were working with, if you were to look at them on average for the year, 98% of retailers were selling lab-grown. But at the end of the year, that became 94%. Now, mathematically, you may think that that's only 4% difference, but an average on a year, 98%, actually, and, and uh, at the end of the year, 94%, that means that more than 4% of, of retailers actually went back to natural, right? That's a great sign, and it's a great sign purely because we're recognizing that people who are looking at the data are understanding that if they do not sell natural diamonds, they will not exist in the next couple of years as retailers. And that is a very interesting thing to be able to see. Now, the next few pages are, are more about what we can do, what we should do, and, and what are we doing as, as, as an industry. And I think, you know, we, we talked about how uh, retailers in the next couple of years are gonna be transitioning back into selling more natural uh, diamonds. But I think we also need to be able to talk to retailers and, and give retailers and empower them with key messages and capabilities to be able to explain why natural diamonds are different than lab-grown diamonds. And they are different products. They are truly different products. One was built or built, uh, developed by Mother Earth more than a billion years in the making. The other one was made by uh, uncle so-and-so uh, in, in a laboratory chamber two weeks ago. One, you can make 100,000 carats of it in one month. The other one, you should be lucky if you can actually mine those goods at a 100,000 carats every single month. So there's a big difference. Imagine the odds of making a diamond. How many of you are chemistry geeks here? A few. So take the Eiffel Tower, and I'm sorry, um, I don't think the, uh, the, um, there's anything as heavy as the Eiffel Tower in Italy that I can think of in, at the moment. But think of the Eiffel Tower, flip it upside down, and take that needle, the sharp point of the Eiffel Tower, and try and hold it on the tip of your finger. That's how much force it takes to take a piece of graphite and convert it into a diamond. The amount of heat that it takes, it's the heat that is created by Earth's core, 
where lava is underneath you and, and, and everything is molten and, and, and hot. Put those two things together. Have some sort of a coal or graphite available underneath the Earth's crust. And those odds create a crystalline that allows for a natural diamond to grow. And it takes a billion years for this to happen. That's why why natural diamonds are considered to be so rare. Because of the odds and the complexity of making the hardest substance in the world take so long for it to become what it has become. So we need to tell this diamond story. We need to be better at talking to our retail partners in talking about how these things come together. And really, I heard this theme throughout the day. We really need to come together. We really do need to unite as an industry. We want to be smart. We need to look at what's ahead, and we need to be able to actually start working on those things so we're not forced upon doing things that we don't want to. We don't want to be surprised as an, as an industry. We want to continue to be able to grow and flourish and be successful. So if there's one thing that I would actually walk away from this meeting with is to remember that coming together and working together for the solutions as an industry is such a critical part of what we're doing. Why is that? Well, if you look at mining, and up, up above is, is the GIA standards for quality of diamonds, if, if you look at it. The stuff below are the rough diamonds that actually make up those uh, polish that's out there. So you plant a rough diamond. Once you plant a rough diamond, what you actually get is uh, a, a natural uh, uh, polished diamond that comes out of that rough. So if you look at all of those things and get the rough to become a polish, it's a great artisan work to allow you to be able to make a beautiful polish that would be an SI quality diamond that, that gives you the, the beautiful sparkle that you see in, in retail stores. Now, if you look at on the mining side, more than 60 to 75% of the goods that come out of the ground are actually SI or lower. And about 25 to 40% of the goods are flawless IF and VVS quality diamonds, right? Now, imagining this and imagining price fluctuations and, you know, when, when people say, oh, you know, the rough mining companies decrease prices by 10%. Well, they decrease rough prices by 10% because they want it to be more closer to where polished prices are after a manufacturer manufactures their diamonds, right? Because that is such an important part of being able to exist. But there's only a certain amount of decrease in pricing that a rough mining company can do before it basically says, listen, this mine, I can't mine anymore. Because if I do, I'm going to lose money. So numbers really matter. As much as words matter, as we heard earlier today, so do numbers. Because these numbers are so critical in making not only mining companies successful, but countries successful. The GDP of some of our African countries depend anywhere between 20 to 40 to 50 percent on, polish, on, on rough diamond sales. So if you think about the impact that diamonds have on some of the partner countries that we work with, it's huge. And we have to be cognizant of that. Now, one of the things that De Beers did for the holiday season uh, in 2023, they initiated a, a campaign to actually help sell um, natural diamonds, and it did help. It brought in retailers again. It got them interested in wanting to know how to be able to sell diamonds and what to do in order to be able to sell diamonds more effectively. And that was a very positive thing to see. And that's why we are really pushing as an industry to get more and more generic marketing. Because once you talk about the diamond story, I doubt that there is anyone that would actually not want to own a diamond. And if we don't, well, this will happen, or this will continue, or this will increase. 
More and more companies will actually say, you know, this whole thing, imagine as a designer, how cool would it be if you're making a piece and you can get the exact millimeter size of what you want, because who cares what the rough costs, right? If the rough costs me $60 or $50, hell, I'll take 100 because I can make the exact same piece that I want to, right? Natural diamonds, they're not widgets. They're natural. So when you want to get a certain millimeter size for a jewelry designer, sometimes you actually have to cut something that's bigger into something that's smaller in order to be able to uh, fit that retailer's needs, which is why the prices are different when you look at natural diamonds for, or than lab-grown diamonds. But if we do not focus on, on talking about the natural beauty of diamonds and why they're important, you're going to get more and more LVMH announcements. You're going to get more and more um, Prada announcements of, of moving into lab-grown and this and that and so on and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that. I love cheap and cheerful stuff. I even love products like a Prada sunglasses with a lab-grown diamond on it. Because you know what? In a year's time, it's unfashionable. I can throw it away and I don't feel bad. But I would never do that with a natural diamond. I still have a Cartier um, gold rim glasses that's sitting in my desk with slight diamond studs around the C's of the Cartier. I don't know if you guys remember those. I cannot throw it away because it's like... Uh, it's, it's gold and it's diamonds. I mean, you don't throw this away. But it's not fashionable anymore. It's sitting in my desk. It's been sitting in my desk for almost 10 years now. But I can't get rid of it because it's made of gold and diamond. If it was lab grown and it was plastic, sure. I'll throw it away. I'll give it to someone. I'll recycle it and, and make sure that, that it gets used in some other way. That's the difference between natural and lab grown. And that's the differentiation that we have to continue to keep. Someone just walked in from the NDC, so I thought I should put this up subconsciously so that the NDC knows that I'm, I, I appreciate what they've done as well. Their campaigns that, that they've developed for the holiday season did help what is required and needed. But I think one of the most critical things that I appreciate about what NDC developed was the... Um, the standards for um, understanding lab-grown versus synthetics, the machinery tests that, that, that they came up with, but also the facts about diamonds so that you can understand what are the true facts about natural diamonds and lab-grown diamonds and, and why they are different, and that's important. And this page, I really think it sums up the presentation and, and what we need to take away from here. Right? If we can educate and we can inform and we can inspire, we can continue to touch our consumers in an emotional manner that matters. SIPJO has a great educational system with the blue books that they have offering retailers, wholesalers, manufacturers, any designer, anyone interested in understanding all the guidelines and information about various different parts of our industry, whether that's uh, gold or it's uh, um, diamonds or, or precious stones, doesn't matter. They have wonderful guides that actually allow you to be able to understand how to, uh, what, how to talk to people about it, what terminologies to use, what terminologies not to use, what are the critical aspects that, that you need to be aware of when you're talking about jewelry and, and products that, that are being sold. Responsible Jewelry Council. You know, the, the uh, setting of the standards and, and, and wanting to go beyond no harm, as, as they talk about, is such a critical part of this industry. You know, when you become an RJC member, you realize that you're a level up above everyone else. And that's what I'm really proud of, of, of seeing what the RJC, uh, when I first started in this industry 15 years ago, um, you know, if you look at it, let's say 12 years ago in comparison to what it is today, they have come so far in being able to understand the needs of retailers, the needs of manufacturers, the needs of, of wholesale, but more importantly, 
the needs of the consumer. And that's, I think, a, a very critical part of, of what the RJC does. It really brings it all together. And of course, the Natural Diamond Council and the Diamond Industry Facts, it's such a critical tool. I often sit with retailers and, you know, the retailers ask some questions and I'm like, but if you just go to this website, Natural Diamond Council, and look at the diamond facts, it's in here. You just look at it, teach it to your employees. You know, we develop a whole bunch of products. Sometimes we're so good at developing things that we become like this convoluted geek technology person, right? And we develop such complex products that we forget who are we building this for? We're building this for not just the consumer, but the person who's standing behind the counter selling to a consumer. It needs to be so simple, so easy to use, that within five bullet points, they will understand why a natural diamond is different than a lab-grown diamond. What makes a natural diamond so unique and special? And if you think about just a few words, did you know that 10 million people's livelihood Depends on natural diamonds. These are people in Africa, in India, in China, in the United States, in Belgium, Europe, uh, Israel, doesn't matter. 10 million people's livelihoods are dependent on natural diamonds. 5 million people actually have access to health care because of natural diamonds. When I was at De Beers, one of the things that I was so proud of was the best practice principles of De Beers. Because it allowed us, as a mining company, to tell our customers that you need to have certain standards to ensure that what is being sold, as we used to say in, in De Beers, a diamond is above luxury. It has its own standards that you must commit to in order to be able to continue to buy rough diamonds to sell them. Why? Because it really is Mother Nature's sign of love, relationship, everlasting connection. I buy a diamond for myself because I'm proud of an achievement that I did, had. I buy a diamond for a loved one because I want to tell them how much I appreciate and love them. And that's why a diamond, when it's in natural form, stands above luxury. So when we think about diamonds and all the good things that they do around the world, I encourage you guys to go to NDC's Diamond Facts. There are many other websites that actually have some of the diamond stories that they talk about the good that diamonds do to the industry, uh, for the industry. Diamonds Do Good is another uh, 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 website that you can go into in Diamond Empowerment Fund. There are some wonderful things that diamonds do for the world. And what's critical is taking that information, using the data that you have at hand, to be able to really transform this industry and be able to market the consumer at the heart. If a marketing for diamonds does not move your heart, doesn't give you the butterflies, it should not be done. So with that, I ask for questions. And thank you for your time.